Ah, yes, there are cars in our lifetime that when we're young, we think to ourselves, I'm gonna own one of those one day. You know, that was my young voice. Still got one. Why? I'm not really sure. It's like, it was like a cool concept car with like the weird roll cage and looked a little bit like a Plymouth and it was exciting. Okay. If you didn't have one of those pictures of Lotus in your bedroom when you were my age, I don't know what to tell you. I'm literally going to put up a picture because I think everyone had this one at least one time in your life. It was kind of neat. It was silver. It was, it, it was, Never mind. Anyway, we grow up and we go from wanting a Lotus with the little half roll cage thing in the back to wanting a Miata or maybe like an S2000, you know, because price. And we realize that that's probably never just going to happen until eventually we start looking back at them after our first autocross event. And you're like, that is a really cool car going really, really fast. And that's faster than a Miata. What the hell is that? It's a Lotus, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Alex. Alex had a fine Instagram. And today we're going to be talking about a car that truly is the definition of an autocross car. A car that when we were young, we thought was a supercar because it was funky looking. We just didn't really know what to do with ourselves. It was a really questionable time for us when we were young. A car that no matter what condition it's in, for some ungodly known reason, will always be $30,000. I don't get it and it does not make sense and it makes me agitated unless I owned one. I don't get it. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're gonna be talking about you wanting to own a Lotus Elise. jumping into this series. Hello. I'm Alex. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't yet, uh, because that would just be, it just be, just be nice. And if you look for aftermarket wheels, tires, or suspension, be sure to check us out at fitmentindustries.com. I really wonder how many times I've said that in my life. It's probably a couple two tree. Anyway, you can do it for your newly acquired Lotus Elise or otherwise, be sure to hit us up. You know what I'm saying? And if you have a Lotus Elise that is modified, be sure to add it to our gallery over at fitmentindustries.com forward slash gallery because we need more of them. Fit bit industries, figment industries, figment industries, fitment industries. FitmentIndustries.com, baby, woo! The Lotus Elise arrived to this wonderfully confused world in 1996, but it was actually designed a few years earlier, 1993, by the British manufacturer, Lotus Cars. Now this is where it kind of gets a little bit funky. You see, Lotus follows a story extremely similar to that of Ferrari. A man by the name of Anthony Colin Bruce Chapman and a couple others, a graduate from engineering school, begins racing and ends up racing a modified Austin 7 for the local trial races. It was pretty much the only vehicle he had and it was there's not really many out there back in that time frame. But over time, he began to modify this little Austin 7 in the way that suited his driving style and needs. And in 1949, he modified an Austin 7 to the point of really pretty much claiming it as his own. He just figured at this point it's mine and he just called it the Lotus Mark II. He didn't actually have a Mark I in all honesty, the previous one was an Austin 7. And he just figured if he did and called it a Mark II that people would just assume that there was a generation before that and grandfathered it in. People in the 40s were different. As the 50s and 60s went on though, Chapman would found the Lotus Engineering Company and begins to produce cars to pretty much do nothing more than feed his racing habit. It was nothing more than just to start building cars that were very similar in the way that he would race his own cars. And pretty much the focus was creating cars that were extremely light, nimble, and focused on weight savings versus straight power of the time. Chapman would build these cars to do nothing more than to just be another side of his racing career. You see other cars come out of the Lotus name like the Elite, the Elan, and more. I mean, all of the names are pretty much that Elise Elan name lineage. It actually comes from different names within the family ownership of the company. Now, Lotus would even pair up with other companies like Ford and Further Cortina and had an essential engineering and development division that would pair up with other car companies from the 50s up and even till the 2000s to help them with their racing lineage. The Lotus name would then have its ups and downs just like every other brand out there with it being mostly lows for productions but highs for the racing successes which is I mean probably why it kind of panned out for Chapman and it was kind of working. The cars weren't inherently anything fantastic because most of them did have quite a bit of reliability issue because they were all handmade cars from somebody who had never really handmade a car before in their entire life. Lotus would find some ground with their introduction of the Esprit, the Esprit, the Esprit depending on who you talk to, but ultimately get bought and sold like a child where neither parents actually wanted them. But when the Elise was introduced to the world in 1996, it was owned by Proton. It was a Malaysian car maker. The Elise was one of Lotus's first real strong successes and its attempt to go back to the cars of what it was known for, essentially just being 
a lightweight, nimble, slow horsepower car instead of fighting against the European supercars that beat. And while the car was kind of weird to look at, especially in the first series, and wasn't introduced in the United States until 2004, it did do a lot of good stuff for Lotus to lead up to the Lotus's introduction into the United States. By 2004, Lotus finally got their safe checkpoint and got their car across the water and into the hands of us. Us. Do I talk with my hands? Yes. I think there's a dance that people do now with the hand thing. It was on TikTok. I don't want to talk about TikTok. 2005 was a good year. The market was booming and I was finally allowed to go to Skate Nation by myself. And the Toyota Elise was sold commercially in the United States. Besides the fact that the first few models headlights could get melted on the inside, which is, that's a real thing. Uh, it was a pretty good car. I mean, it was one of the cars that people in the United States were very, very excited about because it was so opposite of what they were used to. I mean, it was powered by a 1.8 liter that put out around 190 horsepower. There are a couple other variants of the engine trim, but it was ultimately a pretty good car. It had like a Yamaha designed engine. And it was truly something that came out of a prototype book to Britain. That whole Yamaha thing didn't really last long. You see, Lotus's parts and pieces were sometimes pieced together by different manufacturers to help keep the Lotus cost down. And eventually, Lotus would learn that it really needed to get its engine and transmission from Toyota. It was a small British coupe car that had no roof, a decent wheelbase, and a six-speed transmission. A 4.90 to 60 isn't bad either when you consider it as well. I mean, it was pretty much all about the weight. And especially with how they kept everything together, people really enjoyed how this car felt. Because of the motor placement on the back, it actually felt a little bit like an older Ferrari with the engine sitting on top of the rear wheels. In 2008, the Elise would get the old trim makeup. You get the normal Elise, an SC, you could also get the like the, the supercharger, you get a sport package. The supercharger was actually probably one of the best ones with 220 horsepower coming out of a car that weighed like 1,900 pounds. It was pretty nuts. And while the car only featured a few extra pounds versus its predecessor, the updates to the car did well enough for people to aim for these cars versus the early models, especially if you're looking to find a $30,000 autocross toy. The later in the years you can get with the Elise, the better. If you can snag one that's supercharged, even better, even though you can take a naturally aspirated one and supercharge it if you really want to. The unfortunate thing here though is that Lotus Elise was on a permission slip from the United States and the car manufacturer itself was using a waiver from the United States Government of National Highway Traffic to Safety Association. It's really good that they made the acronym the NHSTC, I, whatever it is, because I couldn't say that three times. You see, the Elise failed the little bumper to headlight regulation, but Lotus Pinky promised it would get itself sorted by then. But by then, they had another issue coming across with seat belts and airbags and pretty much everything else that that administration was trying to make safe for the cars and Lotus just didn't really want to deal with it. They ended up not getting it sorted out and then they got the old boot ski, like a, angry teenager at 16 out of their parents' house. It just wasn't a good time. And now they're planning to come back with a 400, but that's an entirely different story. It might have been a good thing because the Series 3 Lotus Elise kind of looked a bit like a smushed Corvette and got oddly soft in the weirdest little places. Really, when we think about a Lotus Elise, almost everyone thinks about the Series 2. I mean, just look at it. It's so much angry. Look at the 3. It looks, looks too happy. It looks too much like a Miata. Only one Miata can exist. Only one happy car can ever exist, and that's a Miata. But we're not here to talk about the history of this damn car. If you want that, get yourself a cable membership. All right, they still have those, and be depressed while you watch the news. Oh no, not here. We're here to talk about you wanting to own one of these bad boys. So you want a Lotus Elise. Well, set down your favorite traffic cone and grab your favorite Icy Hot Patch, because today we're gonna be talking about what it's like to own one of these bad boys. All right? If you're gonna own a Lotus Elise, there's a couple two tree things that you're gonna wanna know beforehand. I don't know what it is about this car or why it changes as much as it does, but the Lotus Elise and every other trim of it for some reason is always $30,000. Two, the cars can require you to shave a few pounds or a few inches off the noggin, depending on how tall you are. The cockpit isn't entirely forgiving, which can leave you loving the exterior, but not so much driving it farther past your local cruise or autocross event. They really are a fun car, but there's not a whole lot to them. And once you actually get inside and drive one around, you'll see exactly what we're talking about. From a reliability standpoint, they've done much better considering Lotuses used to be known for sitting on jack stands a lot more than being driven. And that has a lot to do with Lotus's partnership with Toyota on a lot of the mechanical bits and pieces of the car. You see, when you look at the Lotus Elise, you're actually looking at a Toyota motor, a Toyota transmission, Toyota parts, Toyota assembly. And overall, it's just pretty much an MR2, just slightly neater and has a cool badge and some funky taillights 
which makes a lot of people think it is an exotic car. I mean, I was driving behind one and I just got excited because I, you never see Lotuses around anymore. People will give you flack if you know the underside of the car, essentially the fact that it is a lot of Toyota pieces. But it doesn't change the fact that the Lotus is a banger of a track car. They look fantastic as a show car too, if that's what you're looking to do, but it's not really that typical. We would say it's off meta to make a Lotus a show car, especially if you can source the parts. Modifications can be quite pricey in some areas and dirt cheap in others, depending on what part of the car you're essentially looking at. The Toyota bits and pieces, for example, can be played around with, and for most parts, it's not really that expensive. Most people end up supercharging their Toyota leases and that's just how you do things. But for the rest of the car, it can be get a little bit pricier, especially if it's Lotus only parts. I mean, in terms of wheels, you're probably looking at a staggered setup on some function style wheels like Enki or Koenigs, Bridgestone Potenzas, because a lot of times that's a great budget tire that you can throw on for autocross. And Federals are pretty common as well, with most HPD setups being on Michelins if you're looking for a longer track time. Suspension will be Bilsty and coilover, so you can tighten up the car if you are adding power to it. The Lotus Elise is kind of a weird, funky car. And even if you look at the Evora and the Evora S and all the other Lotus lineup cars, you'll see a lot of people doing different things to them. You'll see most people, especially when they stay stock doing autocross things. As they start to modify them and adding more power, they get into HPD, Road America, and things like that. You really don't see them too much as a show car. There's an army green one that floats around here in Wisconsin with some bronze wheels. It looks really freaking cool. It's a pretty cool looking car. And there's a couple other ones out there that are even on Evoras or things like that that have a full wide body setup like Cam Clutch, which is a really cool car as well. But they're just a unique car that was focused and meant to be a lightweight racing track car and for some reason they never lose value they never seem to be blown up and for every other part of the reason you can pick one up for thirty thousand dollars almost anywhere in the world the biggest issue with lotus elise is that it doesn't have two back seats and the fact that the interior makes your back hurt i mean everything about the seats oh yeah makes your back hurt but what do you think about the lotus elise let us know in the comment section below and of course if you're looking for aftermarket wheels tires or suspension be sure to hit us up over at fitmanindustries.com and if you have a Lotus Elise, add it to our gallery because we really only have like two. It'd be pretty cool if we had like five. You can do that over at fitmanindustries.com forward slash gallery. I'm Alex from Fitman Industries. Let us know what you want us to talk about next. We will see you later. Peace.